The most fun thing for me about making these historical videos is learning the details on cars, people, and events that I thought I knew stuff about, but in reality, was woefully ignorant on. And when we all get together for a deep dive, everybody comes out ahead. I mention this because we're talking about one of the more internet-famous drag cars of all time today, the famed Cotton Picker. It's a back-motor dart station wagon campaigned in 1965 for a pretty short time by NASCAR legend David Pearson, as well as his longtime car owner and crew chief, Cotton Owens, hence the name. There's a pretty big catch here, though. Like me, I'm guessing what you know about the car is either short on details or maybe a little misguided in authenticity, because what I thought I knew was wrong on basically every level. As we've covered in other videos here, when Bill France decided to ban the Chrysler Hemi and NASCAR competition for the 1965 season, it caused a complete firestorm, both among the fan base as well as with Chrysler itself. The company dug at its heels and pulled all of its factory support, including the star drivers from the series. This included not only their top two drivers, but the top two guys in the world of stock car racing, period the 1964 champion Richard Petty, and the man who finished third, David Pearson. Knowing that without something to do and a paycheck from the corporation, those guys would be jumping into the waiting arms of Ford or another manufacturer without hesitation. Sure, these guys loved their Chrysler products, but they were racers, and they needed to make a living. No paycheck, no racing, no real reason to stick around, right? Famously, the two went drag racing. Petty's season is one of the most misunderstood episodes in the history of the sport, and we'll get its full due here in another video. But Pearson's is not too far behind in that regard. As we know, the Petty guys built a couple of Barracudas for the weekly match racing and occasional national event competition that occurred in this era of history. Pretty famously, Petty won the B-Altered class of the 1965 NHRA Spring Nationals, where Pearson was also racing in what was the event's most controversial category. This class was called Match Bash, and it was not an existing NHRA category. It was a gathering of many of the outlaw, wild, weird, early funny cars that populated the Southeast at this time in history, and perhaps none were weirder than the one Pearson was in. The car, as we know, was named the Cotton Picker. It was a bright yellow 1965 Dodge Dart station wagon with an injected Hemi mounted behind the driver, a stretch wheelbase, and as time would tell, a propensity for really hauling the mail but we're already a bit ahead of ourselves. If you're wondering what stock car tricks Cotton Owens worked up into the build of this wagon, you can stop wondering right now. Why? Because Cotton Owens didn't build the car. Let's go back to the beginning to best understand how the cotton picker came to exist, and once you understand that part, the rest will make a boatload of sense, just like it did to me. David Pearson's rise to prominence in NASCAR stock car racing came in the very early 1960s, starting his first races in the 1960 season, and for 1961, ending up in a Ray Fox-prepared Pontiac at the World 600 at Charlotte Motor Speedway. The 1960 Rookie of the Year won that race, along with a couple of others that year, and his star was really launched. By 1964, he was one of the sports superstars, finishing third in the points while scoring eight wins and finishing in the top five of virtually half of the races he entered. The Silver Fox from South Carolina was on a near vertical climb to American racing greatness. And then, the 1965 edict came down. The Chrysler Corporation knew two things when Bill France made the announcement that the Hemi was banned. The first was that they could not lose their pair of lead drivers in Richard Petty and David Pearson. The second was that they were going to weather the storm and get back into the sport. Now, they also knew that Petty and Pearson would be a hot commodity for anybody else. During this era of cutthroat competition in American motorsports, they needed to protect their prime assets, and so with the sport of drag racing exploding in popularity across the country, they sent the guys in that direction. But they did it in two very different ways. The Petty Boys were sent a couple of Barracudas to turn into drag racing cars at their own workshop. Pearson and Owens, on the other hand, were in a different situation. Let's just say there was less work that they needed to do in order to go straight line racing. David Pearson and Cotton Owens were planning to run the USAC series in 1965, so they still had some of their normal shop work to do in preparing their Dodge Coronets for that battleground. Now, this didn't leave a whole lot of time or manpower to scratch build some sort of a drag racing car. Now, this wasn't an issue because the powers at Dodge, well, they knew a guy. That guy's name was Dick Branster, 
He was a racer, but more importantly, his business, Brancer Enterprises, was kind of a secret factory skunk works for Dodge drag racing products. At this time, his guys, specifically Jay Howell, had built stuff like the Little Red Wagon and various factory-backed race cars for Dodge. The head of Dodge PR at this time, the legendary Frank Wiley, came to the shop in late 64 and basically asked Howell and Branster what they would build if given a clean sheet of paper and effectively a blank check. Jay Howell piped right up and said he would build a mid-engine, blown, nitro-burning funny car. That brazen idea would become the Dark Charger, which is a car I covered in a previous video called Party Crashers. The link is on the screen if you want to check it out. It's a history of early funny cars. It was either during or very close to the end of construction of this car that the NASCAR Hemi issue exploded and the Dodge brand needed a car for David Pearson. If you were ever wondering why the cotton picker was a dart wagon with the engine behind the driver, it was literally an issue of timing and convenience. The dart wagon was on the same unit body construction as the two-door sedan that had made the dart charger, so outside of the obvious body style differences between the sedan and wagon, these two cars were identical in so many ways. Completed in March of 1965 and unveiled in early April, the machine was immediately quick. Now we know that Cotton Owens didn't build the chassis, but I'm unsure as to whether he actually built the engine. So let's go with the fact that he did. And if he did, that engine lived in what was once the cargo area of the now screaming yellow wagon, and it came out of the gate swinging. The car ran low tens at over 140 miles an hour at its first outing to the public. As you can see in this story, it seems that Cotton Owens and David Pearson had their turns in this race car. It also clearly states in this piece that Pearson will be running at the USAC race at what is now Lucas Oil Indianapolis Raceway Park in early May. So before we get too far down the road, let's break down the cotton picker. For starters, none of these stories that were published on this car, and there were a bunch, mention who built it, and all infer that it was Owen's handiwork. Obviously, we now know differently, but this was likely the direction Dodge PR wanted to take it. So, Starting life as a 106-inch wheelbase, 170 cubic inch slant 6 grocery getter, the car was stripped down to a bare shell. In the rear, a space of 48 inches by 33 inches was cut out to allow the engine to fit. The stock 106-inch wheelbase was stretched to 123 inches. The rear wheel wells removed, the rockers extended, and all the factory stuff was shifted to give this thing as close a factory appearance as was possible, but it's still kind of weird. The longitudinal frame members of the unit body were removed and replaced with one 10-wall, 5-foot-long, 2-by-3 rectangle chromoly tubing, and that stiffened everything up. Just like the Dart Charger, the engine, transmission, and rear axle were mounted on a sub-chassis that was 64 inches long and 39 inches wide. Now that sub-chassis attached to a front cross member, which could be dropped out for ease of engine and driveline maintenance. Now the good thing was this whole operation worked like a massive ladder bar setup to take the axles want to twist and transmitting that to the front of the car, moving the weight rearward and causing massive mechanical grip on the launch. And this was really one of the car's secrets as to how well it worked when Pearson or apparently even Cotton Owens mashed the gas. The wagon static weight balance with nothing in the nose and the engine rearward was 60% rear and 40% front and that was just sitting still and that's ideal for the business of drag racing where ideally you get 100% of the weight transfer on the rear tires on the good launch. An aluminum firewall was constructed to keep any potential badness from getting to the driver. The grill was blocked off, and the bottom side of the vacant engine compartment was sealed off with aluminum, and that prevented any air from being trapped at speed. Now, the chassis up front was braced up with 035 wall 2 inch diameter chromoly tubing. The front suspension was lightweight stuff from an A100 truck, which was basically the axle and leaf springs, and also the steering box was used in this application. A 1964 Dodge truck push-button gear selector was added to the cockpit, as well as a lightweight seat from that same A100 parts pile. Now, the engine was a 426 Hemi with all the good racer tricks, topped with a Hillborn injection system that had 14.5-inch tall stacks on it. A company called s and built the 32-inch tune-length headers, but also used a 12-inch collector. The front wheels are 15 by 7s and the rear wheels are 15 by 10s and they got shod with M&H Racemaster drag slicks. And of course, there was a parachute to aid in the braking department and to give the fans a show. Now this car was listed as 2,700 pounds in race trim and this is kind of interesting because that's almost exactly the curb weight of the road-going Slant 6 model that the Dart Wagon started as. 
Now you may notice a lot of the same photos being used here, and that's an easy one to explain. Of the multiple magazine features I have in my collection, they all use similar photos. And these photos, and likely the words, as two of these features are identical down to their punctuation, were likely handed to these magazines by Dodge PR itself. And those Dodge PR guys, with Mr. Wiley in charge, were always on it in the 1960s. Through the spring and early summer of 1965, the Cotton Picker made its rounds through the match racing tour, sometimes against other NASCAR heroes like Freddie Lorenzen and the Thunderbolt, Petty and his Barracuda, or other local hitters that wanted a piece of this legendary driver. The car was run on a far less aggressive schedule than was Petty's, who ditched stock car racing altogether and only went drag racing. Beyond his Chrysler factory deal, which was paying handsomely, Petty was supposedly collecting more than $1,000 or more per drag strip appearance, which equates to about $10,000 today adjusted for inflation. So it was a very profitable enterprise to go and run his Barracuda multiple times a week. The most well-documented appearance of the cotton picker came at the 1965 NHRA Spring Nationals at Bristol Dragway in Bristol, Tennessee. Here is some exceptionally rare footage of the cotton picker doing its thing at Bristol Dragway in 1965. I have to thank Jim Amos of Beyond Video for sharing this footage with me. It is absolutely an incredible historical record of the car actually going down the drag strip. As mentioned, the match bash class is where the wagon fell into. Now the track owner, Larry Carrier, demanded that the class be at his national event. Wally Parks didn't want it, and the two of these guys, very powerful, went to loggerheads. Now Carrier basically then threatened to shut the whole race down unless he got the match bash cars at his race, because they were so popular in his area, they knew they would sell tickets. Cooler heads prevailed, and the match bash class got their way, and they got their day in the sun in front of a packed house at Bristol Dragway's inaugural national event. And it really was the high watermark of the cotton picker's popularity in so many ways. It needs to be mentioned that when Pearson and Owens ran this car at its best, it was running very low tens at close to 150 miles an hour. The stated goals for the car when it was introduced to the public were to run in the high nines at over 150, but frankly, the number of runs these dudes put on it, the amount of time they spent with it, didn't necessarily allow them to refine it to that point. One has to wonder at the relief Pearson felt when the Hemi band was announced to be over in July of 1965. The engines, the drivers, and the cars all returned, ironically, to Bristol Motor Speedway that year. Richard Petty had booked drag racing match races all season long when he wasn't running the Grand National Tour, and so Dodge was paying him and he was honoring those drag racing commitments throughout the end of the year. This was not the case with David Pearson. As soon as the NASCAR door reopened, he and Cotton Owens ditched this car like it was stolen property. Dodge owned it, and they promptly shipped it to Bud Fobble, one of the most well-known and loved racers up in Pennsylvania. He ran it with a cotton picker name on the side for a while, and then by the end of the year changed the name back to his traditional Hemi Honker name. The coolest part was, before he repainted it as a Hemi Honker, he was using injected nitro in this car and running way better speeds than Pearson and Owens ever figured was possible. He was also match racing top fuel dragsters with a handicap with this thing. How crazy is that? As I mentioned, Fobble then had the car repainted to match his other line of Hemi Honkers, and he ran it through the end of the 66 season. From 1967 through 1969, the car was campaigned by George Weiler, now, Weiler was Fobble's crew chief and an awesome Pennsylvania drag racer in his own right, a total legend. He renamed the car Mr. Violent, and this is what it looked like. From there on, the car passed through hands and was a bracket racer for years and supposedly ended up as a wheel stander, but is now in the collection of a man on the East Coast, as best as I understand it. In a shortened NASCAR season of just 14 races, David Pearson won twice and finished in the top five eight times in 1965. In the top ten... 11 times. Petty ran 15 races that year, winning four times and finishing in the top 10, 10 times. The two would provide NASCAR fans thrilling battles all the way into the 1980s when their careers wound to an end. Oh, one last story. Cotton Owens had a solid driving career himself before going into the team operator and crew chief life. In fact, two years after he retired in 1962 was his retirement year, but in 1964, Owens came back for one race at the Richmond Fairgrounds. At this Virginia dirt track, he ran a 150-miler against the likes of Richard Petty, David Pearson, and the other stars of the day. The event was held under the lights on Monday night after being rained out the day before. 
Amazingly, Lee Petty predicted that Cotton Owens would probably win the race in less than ideal conditions because of his skills and experience. Battling fender to fender with Junior Johnson, Ned Jarrett, Billy Wade, and the aforementioned others, Cotton Owens set about his work. David Pearson crashed his car on lap 50, which slowed him way down. Ned Jarrett blew an engine. Richard Petty kept fighting mud that was clogging up his radiator and overheating the engine. And then, with 18 laps to go, Junior Johnson also blew an engine, and the wily old veteran crossed the finish line first, trailed by both David Pearson and Richard Petty. Cotton Owens' average speed was 61.95 miles per hour, and there were 23 caution laps during the event. It was the first race he had won since 1961 and the last NASCAR race he'd ever won as a driver. Lee Petty said it best when he said, quote, I believe they made dirt tracks for Cotton Owens to drive on, end quote. And that's the story of the old pro crew chief, a NASCAR driving legend, a rear engine hemi wagon, and how the summer of 1965 had racing fans from across the country rushing from circle tracks to drag strips to see the biggest names compete in any way possible. I'm Brian Loans. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more gearhead, racing, mechanical, and yes, historical content.